Well, good evening or good afternoon, depending upon where you are, and welcome to the July Acting for Justice Gathering. My name is Jack Jezreel, and I serve on the staff of Just Faith Ministries, and I'm delighted you could join us tonight. So let's begin our evening in prayer. This prayer comes from the Pax Christi USA website. It's entitled A Prayer for Disarmament. Breath of all that is, preserve us from our own madness. Direct us away from the dealing destruction to others, a path which leads to the ruin of ourselves and our world. Protect us. Help us to hear you. Jesus Christ, beloved, show us your precious face in all others, you in us and we in each other from all places. Teach us how to lower our defenses. Feed us love which transcends fear. Heal us. Help us to let go of all fear. Holy Spirit, you call us in our minds, in our world, and through each other, speak to us, speak through us. When we worship power, control, money, when we cannot forgive or shove pain onto others, call us, light the fire of love. We will not be afraid, we will not be afraid. Love transcends all fear. You are with us always. Amen. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker tonight. In 2015, Most Reverend John C. Wester was installed as the 12th Archbishop of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Prior to that, he served eight years as the Bishop of Salt Lake City. Archbishop Wester grew up in San Francisco and was ordained to the priesthood in 1976 in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. And there he served in a number of ministries, including pastor, faculty member, campus minister, assistant superintendent at Catholic high schools, administrative assistant to Archbishop Quinn, vicar general, and auxiliary bishop of San Francisco. Archbishop, you're nothing if not uh, 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 versatile, I'll say that. He currently serves on the Founders Board for Catholic Relief Services and as Episcopal moderator for the National Association of Lay Ministry. After reflecting on what was a soul-stirring visit to Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 2017, Archbishop Wester realized how much his own archdiocese is steeped in the nuclear weapons industry and felt called to write about nuclear disarmament. In January of this year, he published a pastoral letter entitled, Living in the Light of Christ's Peace, a conversation toward nuclear disarmament, noting that the urgency for dialogue and action toward nuclear disarmament. This pastoral letter can be found on and downloaded from the Archdiocese of Santa Fe website and is currently available in English, Spanish, and Korean. Also of note, Archbishop Wester will be speaking at the National Pax Christi USA Conference in Washington, DC in early August and Leela will put a link for that conference uh, in the chat. Archbishop Wester, we thank you for making time to be with us this evening, and the microphone is all yours. Thank you very much, Jack and Leila. I'm very grateful to you and to all of you. It's an honor to be with you uh, this evening or this afternoon, and I want to uh, congratulate you on your anniversary and, and all that you do at Just Faith Ministries. I'm very uh, edified and intrigued by, by all that you do. I went online, I told Jack before, and I was really impressed with uh, your website and all of your different ministries. And um, I noticed uh, in looking at all that you do and all the layers of what you do, that really it fits in nicely to my introduction tonight, which um, has to do with relationships, right relationships. This is a real strong scriptural theme, of course. And when I go around for confirmations, I often tell the confirmandi, uh, that really, if you think about it, right relationships, to be in, in right relationship with God, with one another, with the environment, this is grace. Uh, this is what it means to be holy. And to be fragmented, to be out of sorts, to be not in right relationship is sin. It's, it's the sin fragments. It tears apart the, 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 those bonds that unite us. Jesus came uh, to unite us back to God, to one another, 
to the environment, to all of creation, until, as St. Paul tells us, all things will be all in all. And so I, I think that this whole theme of right relationships fits in very beautifully and poignantly uh, with our discussion on uh, multi-level, multi, uh, uh, verifiable nuclear disarmament. Um, I, I, as I sometimes like to quote Father Walter Burkhardt, who is a favorite of mine, um, uh, a Jesuit who was very well known for his preaching. I think he was even awarded one of the test, 10 best preachers in the United States, and uh, he's just a fine man. And um, he speaks about these relationships, and um, he speaks that God uh, himself is, cre- is described as a community of persons, that God is a community of persons, and that you and I are created in God's image and likeness, so that you and I are made inherently at the core of our beings to be in relationship with God and with one another. And he says that those who think otherwise, those who would see religion, for example, as a private affair uh, for, uh, f- to come into a, a religious service just you know, for my own edification without regard to the community, they're, they're, they're getting it wrong and they're doing violence to scriptures. He says, uh, and I'll quote him now rather poetically, that those who read in the sacred text is surely personal individualistic morality have not understood the Torah, have not sung the Psalms, have not been burned by the prophets, have not perceived the implications and the very burden of Jesus's message, and must inevitably play fast and loose with St. Paul. The social focus of God's book is evident on the first page. The song of creation is its overture, our incredibly imaginative God, do not have in mind isolated units, autonomous entities. God had in mind a people, a human family, a community of persons, a body genuinely one. Well, this this whole theme of relationships, as I say, I think very much fits into, I I would suggest anything you do in, in, uh, in Just Faith Ministries and all that we do as people of faith, and I think that uh, this is what really struck me, as Jack mentioned uh, in my introduction, to uh, in this whole uh, movement. Uh, 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 I'm not really new to this. Most of you have been doing it longer than I have, and I commend you for that. But um, uh, it's really something that struck me when I went to Japan in 2017 with Cardinal Levada and Bishop Stephen Blair, both of happy memory. Sadly, they both passed away since then. Uh, but we went basically on vacation, but we did want to stop in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And those visits were very sobering for us. Uh, the tone of our trip uh, changed. And uh, we had some very good prayer and very good talks and reflections uh, during those visits, visiting the museums and the Goboku Dome and all the various um, things that we saw there. But the one that really struck me, as I mentioned in the, in the pastoral letter, is um, somewhere I saw that the children, the little children in school, when they, they saw the bright flash of the nuclear bomb detonating above them, they rushed to the window to see what it was. And I felt this instant sadness. I said, you know, you want to say, no, you know, run away, don't do that, you know, but not that it would have, they could have gone anywhere at that point. But um, it was really a, a sadness that I felt that I, I thought of, you know, um, I don't have it with me now, but, you know, T.S. Eliot talks about the language of the dead that is charged with fire. And I thought of the, the, the voices of those children, all those people who were killed by the atomic explosion then, uh, that their voices are still speaking to us. Um, uh, they're, they, they are dead now, but their, their voices, I think, echo through, this, through the decades, and they, 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 it is tongued with fire, their speech, and it's the speech that we need to listen to. Uh, and I think what they're saying to us is that this is not right relationships. This is the exact opposite. And so um, I, I was struck by these thoughts um, coming home back to the United States, and then taking some friends and family to the various museums in Santa Fe. And I came upon this very large exhibit down in the lower level of this museum in in Santa Fe, very near the cathedral uh, of the the Manhattan Project. And it takes you through the whole series of that. And I was just talking actually before this, uh, our Zoom meeting with some of my, uh, my collaborators on the pastoral letter 
And one of the members, Jay Cog, was reminding me that just about a block and a half away from the cathedral is where the uh, Oppenheimer and other scientists went into the door and they gave them their name and they got a number and they went out the back door and were taken up to Los Alamos and where they worked on the first nuclear arms. And then, of course, detonated the first detonation of the Trinity test site. So it really struck me, this contrast here. Here we are, at, uh, here I am, Archbishop of Santa Fe, of where this actually began, the nuclear armaments, and, and having be, just been to Japan and saw the devastating effects of those nuclear armaments. And I felt that it was really important to speak as a pastor to this whole notion of right relationships and how nuclear weapons threaten the very fabric of these relationships that God intends for us to have. They not only threaten them, but they threaten to, to absolutely obliterate and, and annihilate these relationships. Uh, when we study, and it's in the, we put in the letter some of the uh, technical parts of these nuclear thermonuclear bombs, the, the first the fission bombs and the fusion bombs, and, and how devastating they are and, and the impacts that they would have. And even when we talk about nuclear weapons, we traditionally speak of these arms as being in silos. I remember in 1962, I was 12 years old and I was walking home from school. That was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And of course, we knew as kids, I don't know how we knew, we were always running around exploring and we saw the big barbed wire, uh, you know, these uh, nuke, the Nike uh, sites. They were not nuclear weapons then, or these were just the very beginnings of this. Uh, in 62, but they were still very uh, powerful. And so when we saw the planes going overhead, we were really afraid uh, that, you know, that those were Russian planes and we were also afraid. And, but we spoke of those Nike missile sites as being in silos. And that's interesting, you know, because that again is a word of fragmentation. People are in silos, you know, that, that were polarized. And, and, and certainly it's a fitting uh, metaphor for nuclear arms because it would certainly silo the entire creation and, and catapult it into a cold a nuclear winter that would last for well over a decade. And so um, it's, it struck me that we should write this letter. Uh, Saint, uh, in Santa Fe, officially La Via Real de la Santa Fe de San Francisco de Assis, is the, the, the royal town of the holy faith of St. Francis of Assisi. And St. Francis is their patron of our archdiocese and of our cathedral. I just had lunch today with some of our Franciscan brothers and Father Jack Clark Robinson, uh, who's been transferred, but he was in town. We had a lovely visit. And we talked about that and how the Franciscans promote this whole notion, the whole uh, St. Francis's, you know, prayer that, to make us instruments of peace. And so uh, that's the purpose of the letter, that we would uh, rejuvenate and sustain a conversation about nuclear disarmament as something that is urgent. It's an urgent conversation. One of the difficult things of this uh, cause is that it's very difficult because people don't see nuclear arms. I myself have never personally seen a nuclear warhead. Uh, I, you know, we're not allowed in. And it's very, the, the the laboratories, when I go up to Los Alamos to the I'm at the heart of Mary Church, I can see the big uh, toll lines where you have to go in and, you know, it's, it's high, high security. Uh, this is very private. So it's not something that's really in our consciousness as, as much. And I think we've been lulled into a false sense of complacency. Uh, I think the, the tragedy of, of Ukraine right now has heightened an awareness of the power of nuclear arms, even when they're not being used, they're powerful as Putin, uh, you know, rattles his nuclear sabers. But uh, nonetheless, we see that, uh, that this is an urgent issue and, and the conversation must be had because it's something that people tend to ignore. And frankly, uh, I have to say in all honesty, I sometimes feel like a skunk at a lawn party when I speak about disarmament because people, I don't want to think about that. And I don't want to think about being annihilated and, and obliterated. And, and it is a difficult subject, but it's something that we must address because I remember my, one of my Latin professors in the minor seminary said the two worst words in the English language are too late. And he was trying to tell us not to be late with our term papers or our translations, but I would apply it here to this. You know, if thermonuclear war was ever begun, it frankly would be too late. All of our efforts would be too late. There's nothing more we could do. I'm reading Daniel Ellsberg's book now, The Doomsday Machine, and I'm about halfway through it. I decided it's not a good book to read before going to bed at night because it's rather sobering and frightful. But 
So, so this is my concern that we've got to engage the conversation as difficult as it is, as, as, uh, as much as people don't want to talk about it, we have to talk about it. Another, uh, I'd like to share with you that uh, very bluntly and, and, and candidly that uh, Pope Francis has been a huge inspiration to me and to our church here in, in Santa Fe. I just love Pope Francis. And every time I see a picture, I would just like to go up and hug him. You know, he's just such a wonderful uh, person, a wonderful Pope. And uh, I think, he, you know, I, I, really a testimony in my mind to the Holy Spirit working in our church. And um, uh, Pope Francis, of course, uh, came out with a very strong statement um, and when she said uh, in, in, um, in November, 24, uh, November 24th, 2019, at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park, and then he repeated again on November uh, uh, later on, but he said, the use of atomic energy for purposes of war is immoral, just as the possessing of nuclear weapons is immoral. Now, that was really moving the needle because uh, all of the modern day popes have spoken against nuclear armaments. The Vatican has always been one of the first signatories on the TPNW. There is just an incredible uh, witness that the popes and the Catholic Church uh, have given to the dismantling of nuclear armaments. But this is the first time that we've heard that even possessing nuclear arms is immoral. Now, what we do with that is important. Obviously, Personally, I'm not advocating for unilateral disarmament, but that's an unsettling fact. How do you live with that? That even possessing nuclear armaments is immoral, that, that the United States having nuclear armaments is immoral. That's something we just cannot ignore. So I think the Pope has really moved the needle and we put up in Santa Fe in front of our Lady Guadalupe shrine, we have a sign that says just that as an image, a silhouette image of Pope Francis and his quote. So, uh, and we did it because uh, Los Alamos Labs has just begun a new enterprise of, of a new pit core uh, run, uh, uh, manufacturing for the nuclear armaments. Even though the pit cores we have now are perfectly good and they will remain good for decades to come, we are engaged in this, this uh, rejuvenation of the pit cores. And they've moved a lot of their offices to downtown Santa Fe to make room at the laboratory for this new enterprise for which, of course, they're receiving billions of dollars. So it struck me that it's really important for us to have this conversation and to see what we're going to do and to take these steps before it's too late. Um, one of the um, things I hear a lot, of course, is that we should have nuclear arms uh, for um, uh, deterrence, that, uh, that this is why we have them. And I know this has been a justification for having nuclear arms for a long time. I think it's important to say from the outset that the United States, from my research and talking to people who are far more enlightened than I on these matters, has never possessed nuclear arms simply for deterrence. We've always had a plan for first strike capabilities. And not only that, but we've had plans not only you know, to defend ourselves, but also to extend a nuclear war to other countries that were not even involved from the beginning, but this was part of our plan. If you, if you read the, the documents that are now available to us, and this is in Daniel Ellsberg's book as well. So I think that this is something to really take a hard look at. You know, if we needed only deterrence, you know, it wouldn't take the 5,550 or so nuclear arms that we have and the 6,200 and so that the Russians have and the 300 or whatever the Chinese have and et cetera, et cetera. That's simply not uh, deterrence only. It's, it's for far more than that. And so I think that it's something that we, uh, we need to, uh, to look at from that point of view as well when people say that. Another thing that I hear a lot in terms of, of, of this conversation is, well, you know, there is such a thing as a just war. Well, again, uh, thank God our, our wonderful Pope Francis just recently, and I've got to get this exact citation, but just recently the Pope uh, has said, you know, that really there is no such thing as a just war. And I think it's important to remember, too, that in even coming up with a just war, whether in Augusta or being developed later on, that the purpose of the intentionality of that was to limit war, to, to hopefully one day eradicate war. It wasn't to, to justify it. So, oh, goody, now we get to have more wars. The whole purpose of it was to, to limit and, and to, to hopefully eliminate war. 
But even that, you know, we know now with nuclear armaments that even taking the, the traditional uh, principles of just war um, no longer makes sense. Uh, for example, the whole idea of that uh, a just war had to be, um, you know, it had to be um, uh, equal, that you couldn't do more than, than you were attacked. Well, uh, there's no such thing as equality when you have nuclear arms that would destroy the entire planet and all of, of life as we know it, uh, you know, not to uh, target uh, civilians. Well, there's no way you can not target civilians with, a, with a, um, uh, a nuclear war, that there has to be a reasonable chance of success. Well, there's no reasonable chance of success if you wipe out the entire, entire planet. So it goes on and on. So the, the just war, I think the Pope is right, that we have to we have to really take a hard look at that and, and, and see that this is not something that's possible uh, with nuclear armaments. Another thing that, um, that the letter uh, talks about is, um, is the whole idea of the gospel of Jesus Christ as a gospel of nonviolence, a gospel of peace. Um, I think this is something important for us to look at. And I think, again, looking at the Just Faith Ministries, you know, clearly you are living uh, a gospel of peace and you're, you're, you're putting into practice what that means. Um, I think that our tendency, and I'm still working with this, I, I, I want to be careful not just to speak, you know, without foundation here, but I do think that we tend to water down that aspect of, of, of uh, the gospel of peace. One of the deacons at the cathedral said one of the big problems we have as human beings is yeah, but. And I said, what's a yeah, but? And he said, you know, yeah, but. Yeah, I'm all for peace. Yeah, but uh, we have to defend ourselves. We have to have this or, yeah, I'm all for, I'm all for you. I'm all for, yeah, but uh, nonetheless. And so the, you have to watch what people say after yeah, but. So I think that, um, I don't think Jesus had a lot of yeah, buts. I think he was pretty clear when the disciples wanted to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans, Jesus said, no. No, he was very firm when they pulled out the sword in the Garden of Gethsemane and the, and the, and the night of the, the, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus' uh, passion the next day. You know, Jesus had put away the sword. You know, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. sword. And so, it's, and you can go through the scriptures and see explicitly and implicitly that Jesus was really proclaiming uh, this gospel of peace and I think this is something we have to look at. I know that, um, you know, as they get more and more into this very critical movement, a lot of people uh, say to me, well, you know, John, you're being rather idealistic and even naive. You know, you're being rather naive. You know, this is the real world. But I, I think Jesus was a realist, not an idealist. He was a realist. And Martin Luther King said that very beautifully and eloquently in his many speeches. He, he said that he, Jesus, is, Martin Luther King said, Jesus was not an impractical idealist. He was a practical realist. And, uh, and he lived that. He lived it all the way to the cross. And so I think that that's something that we need to, uh, to look at is the gospel. And what does it mean to be a peacemaker? And how are we watering that down as a church or even as individuals? Uh, I know it's not an easy thing to, to look at. I know we have... Uh, uh, pacifists in our tradition, our Catholic tradition, and other traditions in our country uh, who have lived that out. Some have been uh, even executed because of their beliefs. Um, it's, it's not an easy uh, question, but I think we do have to look at it. Um, one of the ways it's helped me to look at it is kind of looking at uh, the third way. Um, I'm going to mention this in the, in the Pax Christi talk, but I think it's a very uh, important um, um, way to look at this whole idea. Um, it came to me from actually Bishop uh, Robert Barron brought it up. It was um, He was talking about uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu in the apartheid South Africa and how he was being um, bullied by a, a, a racist uh, man and, uh, and how Bishop Tutu um, uh, stood up to him. He didn't hit him. He didn't run away, but he stood up to him and reflected back the violence that this man was was perpetrating on him through his racism and bigotry. And I thought right away of, um, uh, you know, uh, the beautiful uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, 
And that beautiful scene, you know, where uh, Harper Lee describes Atticus Finch coming out of Tom Robinson's cabin there. He's going to, he's defending Tom Robinson, as you know, and, uh, and the two children, Jem and Scout, are in the car, and Bob Ewell comes up and he spits in Atticus's face. And it's a very powerful, dramatic scene in that movie. And, and uh, Gregory Peck uh, in the movie, you know, he stands there as the spittle is, is running down his face. And, you know, you're, I'm waiting for uh, uh, a John Wayne or a Clint Eastwood to punch him in the nose. And, to, and then the kids in the car would go, hey, good for you, Dad. You showed him, boy, you know. And, and Atticus just stood there for what seemed like an eternity. And Jem and Scout were just staring at him. And Atticus pulls out his handkerchief and he, he wipes the spittle off his face, staring at Bob Ewell gets in his car and drives away. To me, that's an, an enactment of the third man. I think that's what we're about in nuclear disarmament. You know, we're not using violence to fight violence. We're not running away either, as much as some people would like us to. But rather, we're standing there staring uh, nuclear armaments in the eye, so to speak, and reflecting back the violence that they would perpetrate on our earth. And, and, and allowing that moment of truth to speak for itself. This is exactly what Jesus did when he stood before Pontius Pilate. And uh, he did not call down legions of angels to, to, to destroy Pilate, nor did he run away. He could have run away. Uh, Jerome Murphy O'Connor speaks eloquently of how Jesus could have gone to Bethany where Lazarus and Martha and Mary were, and he could have slipped out into the desert and they never would have found him. And he knew what was happening, but he, 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 he didn't run away. He stood in, in the face of that violence and reflected back the violence that people wanted to perpetrate upon him and gave them an opportunity to repent, to have a metanoia. And I think that's what our work is about, is, is to stare this kind of violence of nuclear armaments in the face and, and to give people the chance to repent and to have a change of heart, a metanoia, and to be makers of peace and not makers of war. And I think that's exactly why uh, I, the, the pastoral letter I'm hoping will promote this conversation uh, about peacemaking and about uh, un, you know, uh, uh, dis disarming our nuclear armaments. I think all of us have been you know, certainly um, shaken and continue to be shaken by what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, my fear is that uh, you know, I think as a people, we've become inured to war. Cardinal designate uh, McElroy wrote an article in American Magazine uh, many years ago in which he talked about how we've become inured to war. And um, uh, I think it, we're becoming inured even to the war in Ukraine. I can even, I, wore, I don't have it on, I'm, I took my jacket off, it's too hot, but the, um, I have a lapel pin with the Ukraine flag on it just to remind me anyway, to, to not to stop praying for those poor people and to keep, keep it in my, my thoughts and prayers, uh, this horrible thing that's going on uh, in Ukraine. And I think that at least for the first time in my life, um, since 1962, I can remember standing in my room at the rectory in Albuquerque, hearing the news on February 24th when the war started and thinking, oh my goodness. And then hearing Putin say, don't forget world, you know, I have nuclear arms. And for the first time I thought, oh my golly, this really could turn into the third world war. This, and I, I don't say that, you know, to be a fear monger, but I was really nervous about that. Since February 24th, I don't find myself afraid of that as much, but the threat hasn't lessened really. And, and so, so I think that this, this terrible war has really uh, underscored our need to, 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 um, to, uh, to be really urgent about this conversation. Uh, in the letter, I quoted Secretary Robert McNamara, who was the uh, Defense Secretary under Kennedy. And he said, the reason that humanity survived the Cuban Missile Crisis was luck. That's one heck of a thing for the Secretary of Defense to say, it was luck. It wasn't our strategies or our intelligence or anything that anyone did. It was luck. Uh, it was, you know, I think that Khrushchev and Kennedy both wanted by 
uh, by all means, they both wanted to avoid a nuclear war. They both were convinced and determined to avoid a nuclear war. And yet, despite that determination, we came, des we came very uh, scarily close to the brink of nuclear war. Even though they didn't want it, we came very close to it. It was luck. Ultimately, I would say it was God's providence that our guardian, God sent special guardian angels to watch over us. The nuclear arms race that we're in right now uh, is more uh, dangerous than the first one. The, um, the cyber, cyber warfare techniques, hypersonic delivery platforms, artificial intelligence, uh, we cannot depend on humanity's luck to hold out especially when we have unhinged and ruthless leaders who make irresponsible statements. For example, that we could face consequences we've never seen before and fire and fury like the world has never seen. Uh, Trump said that uh, to, to North Korea at first. These are irresponsible things to say and living in this kind of a world, uh, we need to have this conversation. Here in, in, in Santa Fe, we know now that there's a, a modernization program. I spoke about the pit cores going on that wishes to spend $1.7 trillion in the next 10 years to modernize our weapons. And uh, this money would be better spent uh, on technology at our labs that would be developed by our labs to ensure that we do have a verifiable uh, uh, multilateral uh, nuclear disarmament. I think that, um, uh, you know, I was very struck by uh, a quote that I saw on the website of um, um, uh, Nuke Watch New Mexico that Jay Coughlin heads. And it's a quote by General Omar Bradley. I never saw it before. He said that ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. We know more about war than we know about peace more about killing than we know about living. We have grasped the mystery of the atom and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. That's a profound thing for a general of the army to say, and I think a very on target thing. You remember the, uh, just recently, Pope Francis in his Urbi at Orbi speech quoted the Russell Einstein manifesto. And he quoted, in that manifesto, it says, here then is the problem which we present to you stark and dreadful and inescapable. Shall we put an end to the human race or shall humankind renounce war? I think that's the, the topic of our conversation, that we're, that we're having a conversation before it's too late, a conversation to ensure right relationships in our world and in our churches, in our homes, in our country. Uh, we pray for peace in Ukraine and peace in all the other conflicts and wars that are taking place throughout our world. We pray for peace in our, in our country and in our homes, and that by the grace of God, peace will break out if we keep working for it assiduously and urgently. I'm very honored to be a part of that conversation with you tonight, and I congratulate you, and I assure you of my prayers for your work in Just Faith Ministries, and I, I ask that we pray for one another in this very important work and pray for Pax Christi and all those wonderful organizations and groups of people that are working so hard for peace. Since I've had the privilege and honor of being involved in this work, I've been very, very uh, edified and, and just really, um, I'm so proud to be uh, working with you and so many people who are, are working on this. So I, I, I pray that we can keep this conversation going. I look forward to... Uh, being with you uh, and for the rest of this Zoom call so that we can continue the conversation and so we can be instruments of Christ's peace. Thank you very much. Archbishop, thank you so much. That was uh, really compelling. And now what we'd like to do is give uh, all of us a chance to talk together. We're going to break up into small groups for 15 minutes and Leela is going to post the questions uh, for the conversations in the chat so that we can talk together about Archbishop Wester's uh, presentation. So may I suggest uh, you introduce yourselves and then jump right into the questions. Feel free to tackle whatever question is compelling to you personally and share your thoughts with the group. 
As soon as I stop talking, Leela's going to send you an invitation to join a breakout room. So please join in, share some wisdom, and we'll reconvene in 15 minutes for some Q&A time with Archbishop Wester. So thanks, Leela. Go ahead and do the breakout rooms now. Welcome back. Thank you all for being a part of uh, the conversation uh, with your group. And um, now I just wanted to um, invite us to have a little Q&A with the Archbishop. And to that end, I'd like to um, invite you to send your questions to me. You can send them to Leela, she can forward them to me. But in any event, in any event get them to me one way or the other. Um, I have a couple of questions to get us started as soon as um, you're ready, Archbishop. Set. I hope. Good. Great. Well, the, the question that I uh, thought of while we were in the breakout sessions was, um, obviously, the conversation itself is critical and, and prompting conversations like you have done with your statement has been invaluable, I think, just terribly important. Obviously, there is um, a point where the conversation sort of interfaces with uh, the political conversation. In other words, um, any one of us cannot stop the funding for nuclear weapons as citizens, but we can appeal to politicians to make changes um, to prompt uh, a conversation for uh, disarmament globally. I'm wondering how you see that transition happening. What, what are, what's the mechanism between the conversation and then political engagement that you have, that you have thought to yourself might be most effective? Well, um, from my perspective, uh, I think that, you know, I think the church, as a matter of fact, when we were just, uh, uh, Barbara in our little small group was just making a very good point about church leadership. Uh, I think the church, members of the church, I remember we're all part of the church, you know, by baptism, all of us are uh, lay leaders, we're all, well, lady, we're all part of the church. I think that um, we do have a voice that we sometimes don't, don't make use of or don't use enough. Now, um, we got we went back to the Green Group, which is nice. So I didn't hear what Barbara was going to finish with, but I think I think her point was going to be that sometimes we don't hear as much from the church, you know, and um, that we could hear more. And uh, I, the Pope, that's why I'm so proud of Pope Francis for taking that very strong and courageous stand against nuclear weapons, because I think that can have an influence on political leadership. I think we can have an and if we were really to. When I, I met, when I was chair of immigration, we went and met with um, uh, uh, Congress Nancy Pelosi when she was Speaker of the House the first time about immigration, and she made a point to me. She said, "Well, you better get the Catholics uh, to get behind this because most Catholics are not for what the bishops are for in immigration." And so I think what she was saying was, politicians go by the votes; they put their finger in there and see where the votes are. And I think that if we can really convince our politicians that we have a, a, a critical mass here and that they're, they're, they're going to pay at the polls if they don't listen, you know, I think that's so I think that gives energy to, uh, you know, this whole idea of making our message, you know, politically effective. And I think, you know, or community organizing, uh, we have a lot of community organizing uh, in our in our country. Uh, you know, the um, IAF and, and all of those different or community organizers, they can do a lot to get people together to have a significant voice. Uh, I think sometimes we're just too timid, you know, we don't want to rock the boat, you know, and uh, I think we've got to get out there on this and, and just for the preservation of our of our planet and, and what kind of a world are we going to live, leave to our, uh, our uh, your children, <laughs> which, you know, generically our children, you know, we need to, to have that kind of enthusiasm and that urgency. I think what I'm trying to say in the letter is that this conversation, there's an urgency to it. And so we have to, uh, you know, the old, you know, put urgent, important, and, you know, that little square, you know, well, this is important, but it's also urgent. Mm -hmm. And we can't. And so I think if we can do that, I think it will make a difference. I, I would say, you know, as parishioners, uh, I know maybe different faiths represented here. I don't know but all the faiths, but go to your pastor or your imam or your rabbi or whomever and, and, and make this point, you know, write letters. And I think if we all do it, you know, support groups like uh, Just, Fa uh, Just Faith Ministries and Pax Christi and ICANN and Back from the Brink and all these different organizations, you know, to support them. And, you know, I think it just, 
it depends on that kind of enthusiasm and politicians pick up on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Archbishop, uh, several people have asked, um, how has been the reception of your letter amongst the bishops themselves? Well, um, I haven't been pilloried. It hasn't been a, uh, so there's nothing negative to report. I have a few bishops that are, you know, uh, uh, Bishop McElroy, Cardinal Designate McElroy, a friend of mine, we went to grammar school. You know, he, people that I know have been very positive. Of course, he's been speaking about this for years, and um, uh, I can't come near his academic prowess, but I can, but, uh, but I, I, and so bishops like that have been very favorable. Um, I'd say it's rather muted. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, a couple of bishops have said nice things. I saw them in San Diego at the meeting, but it hasn't. There hasn't been a whole lot of. Um, I don't. I don't think. I, I'm sure many bishops would agree. It's just that they don't. You know, haven't said much to me. Right. And is there um, is there a forum where bishops across national borders can be in conversation about obviously the whole matter of nuclear disarmament is a is a matter that affects the globe. And so is there a place for bishops to be talking to each other about the nuclear issue beyond national borders? I think the best place for that would be through the Vatican. Unfortunately, the Vatican is and has been a very strong supporter of nuclear disarmament. And uh, they were the first signatory in the TPNW, as I understand it. And um, so I think through the, you know, Cardinal Cherney's Dicastria on Human Development, and those, I think that that's a good way for bishops to talk across borders. Uh, there are other means, and perhaps someday we can even get this to be part of a synod, you know, an international synod. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think part of our goal in the conversation is to ratchet this up mm-hmm. to that kind of a level where people would see that as important and necessary. I'm seeing also perhaps a way of combining um, care for the earth and nuclear disarmament because the two go hand in hand. I think that maybe, uh, you know, the environment, to take Laudato C and to promote Laudato C and then to couple with it nuclear disarmament, uh, the, the, the nuclear climate uh, crisis we're in now is something that's gradual. Uh, nuclear, arm, nuclear destruction would be instantaneous. It would only take a few hours to destroy the whole planet. And then the fires, that would there'd be huge fire. Anything combustible would catch fire within 12 miles of, or more of the detonation. And so there'd be just, uh, you know, um, so I think that, you know, if we can combine those two things that there are, they're linked, quite clearly linked, I think that would be uh, uh, a good way to do it as well. Archbishop, could I ask um, uh, how your, your uh, letter has interfaced with church life in your diocese? That is, have you tried to create a, a, a kind of study guide that would be usable by parishes there? And how has that gone? Well, um, I would say that it's uh, a couple things. We're just coming out of bankruptcy right now in the Archdiocese, and I'm coming up. Uh, if anyone would like to send me a check, we have to come up with $121 million. <laughs> so if you have a few million dollars you don't have to do with, let me know. But I think, I'm just kidding. But I think, um, so that's obviously our, our, that's taking our attention. Um, but uh, Anne Avalon and Leslie Radigan are on my staff. They've been very instrumental in the writing of the letter. Jay Coglin from here uh, and um, also Father John Deere is very instrumental in the writing. So they, they've, they um, um, the, the Archdiocese, I, I'd say again, it's, um, it's I'm, I'm still trying to assess this. Uh, nobody's throwing uh, rotten goose eggs at me, but they're not clapping either you know it's kind of so and we talked about this in our small on our small group our little uh, breakout session just now um that um uh, you know there may be a lot of uh, fear here too you know it's a topic that people are it, it does make people afraid and they don't want to talk about it. they don't want to think about it you know it's kind of like putting our heads in the sand but um i'd say that you know the the archdiocese has been um now, there's certain people here who have been really happy, but uh, I'd say it's been rather lackluster here in, the, in, the, in, the, in New Mexico. And I think mo- a lot of that has because of the jobs. I didn't bring that up in my talk, but that's a huge issue, uh, the jobs that it creates. Uh, but it doesn't help 
most of our citizenry, it helps only a very small, small, small fraction, but that is an issue here. So I think that's another reason why it may be kind of a, a tepid response. The biggest response have been people like Just Faith Ministries, Pax Christi, ICANN, uh, you know, Back from the Brink. These have been the, the biggest responders, uh, people who are already in this and who know the score, who know about it, and who've educated themselves about it. So I'd say that uh, the, the, the most positive response I've got is from people who have been working on this and see the pastoral letter as a possible way to maybe jumpstart or to help us to continue the conversation. Um, one of the things that came to my mind was, um, is the work of peacemaking uh, is Pope Francis's message, which is sometimes parked in the category of Catholic social teaching. Is there a case to be made about um, how the language of peacemaking, the teaching about peace ought to be part of sort of the standard catechesis that a Catholic, for example, should expect to bump into as just a, in the course of being a Catholic parishioner? for example. I think so. You know, as is often said, the Catholic social teaching is often one of the best kept secrets in the Catholic church, you know, and I, it's too bad that's the, if that's the case, it probably is. But uh, I think that in some respects, our church has been too focused on a couple of issues and not, you know, on uh, not to diminish, those are all important issues, but we need to be more global in our approach, you know, and, you um, and so I would say, yes, I think in our seminaries, I think we need more education on Catholic social teaching. I think there's too much uh, emphasis on, um, you know, more of a kind of a, a rules-based rigid church rather than a prophetic gospel proclaiming church. I think that, uh, you know, in our RCIA programs, this should be, I mean, I don't want to get, again, I, I, I'm not political by nature, so I, maybe I'm my colleagues here are trying to uh, inject me with more, uh, <laughs> to be a little more that way. But um, I would say, you know, at a grassroots level, you know, not only is climate control, but I think also gun control, or I would say gun safety. When you say gun control, it turns a lot of people off. But gun safety, you know, we've got to get rid of guns in our country, in my opinion. I think that we have to fight the NRA and other such groups that are promoting violence. And I, I saw a bumper sticker the other day uh, a while back. It said that the NRA kills children. And I was with the priest friend going to have lunch. And he said, come on, John, let's have lunch. I said, no, I want to wait and see who's driving this truck because he's not going to be alive very long. And I just want to see who's, who's got the, the courage to put that kind of a bumper sticker in New Mexico because um, uh, we're not quite as gun-toting as Texas, but we're pretty close. So... I think all of these things, you know, the death penalty, uh, all these things need to be. And then what we do for for the poor, for pre, uh, you know, prenatal and postnatal uh, lives, for mothers uh, who are carrying children who are alone and isolated and are, are poor. Uh, you know, I think we've got to really look at the whole spectrum. I know many do, and, and I think we. I, I think you're right on track there, Jack. That that's what we have to really start. One of the things I've noticed, though, is that a lot of I had Bishop McElroy uh, several years ago when I was Bishop of Salt Lake City come out and speak to our priests because our priests were reticent to talk about social justice issues from the pulpit, whether it's because they're afraid of controversy or confrontation or they're afraid people will they'll stop giving. I get letters like that all the time. I'm no longer going to give to your uh, archdiocesan fund because of your position on immigration or maybe now because of nuclear. Uh, it's interesting when you look up the records, you know, they give five dollars a year. So they said, well, I think we'll get by without your five dollars. But <laughs> but but the point is, I think that might be why sometimes priests are reticent to uh, to uh, to speak about it. But so Bishop now Cardinal McElroy spoke very eloquently because he's an expert on on social justice. He, he's got a Ph.D. in moral theology and a Ph.D. in political science. So he's. Uh, an expert on these matters. And uh, so I think we do need to really emphasize, and I think that's what Pope Francis is trying to do, his emphasis on immigration, on on the poor, the vulnerable, uh, looking at, you know, all of the, uh, the, 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 my, all of these issues, bringing them to the fore. I think he's trying to, to, to bring the Catholic Church back to that very strong position again. So I hope, I hope, I hope he lives to be well over 100. One of our attendees tonight writes in, Archbishop, uh, that they're guessing that your message is uh, is being paid attention to by young people. 
they go on to ask or mention that uh, they, it's their opinion that uh, this is exactly what young people are looking for, a church that speaks to difficult issues, that speaks to hope, that speaks to the possibility of, of uh, making the world a, 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 a better place than it is. And I'm just wondering if you've had any um, young people respond to your letter in ways that you can share with us. Not specifically um, as of yet. I think uh, we're, we're forming a, a new Peace and Justice Commission in the Archdiocese, and uh, it won't be a surprise to you that nuclear disarmament will be one of our major uh, thrusts here in the Arch, because we are Archdiocese Santa Fe, as I say, and this is where the nuclear bomb was created. So I think that we, I think we need as an Archdiocese to be at the table on this conversation in a very real way. But I, I do agree with you. I'm glad you brought that to my attention. I do think young people are very conscious of of, uh, of fairness. Uh, of, you know, as of course that's I taught high school. You know, they're very, they sometimes have an exaggerated sense of fairness, and 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 but that's good. I mean, they're they're struggling and and, and working with that. But I think that that's it. I think you're quite right on that. Uh, I think we need you know. <laughs> I mean, we need more young people leading our country. Uh, you know, we need more women leading our country, in my opinion. Uh, in my experience, I find uh, women leaders tend to uh, give more attention to compassion, to listening rather than talking, uh, to, to being able to converse before we hit each other with fists and guns. And so I think that these are things, that, and I know Pope Francis is doing this too in the church. You know, we need more women in authority. I think one of the things we do in the church is we need to divorce authority from holy orders. Uh, the two don't necessarily go hand in hand. And so I think a lot of, you know, this kind of movement, I think, uh, you know, young people, women uh, in, our, in our church and in the, in the, in the public square, I think that we need to start listening to those voices more and more. Um, I, you know, it's too probably too easy a thing to say, but and I, I, I respect very much the wisdom of the years and our leaders who have great wisdom. But, you know, we have if you look around the whole world, we have a lot of older men running countries and running armies and, and uh, nuclear uh, facilities. And uh, I think there's a real connection there. And I think it should make us a little bit more afraid. Well, Archbishop, uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. If I could uh, invite everybody to show their appreciation with a, uh, a visual hand clap. We're so grateful for not just your presentation tonight, but for your witness, your willingness to talk about difficult issues, to prompt the church to reconsider a topic that's difficult to talk about and needs to be talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're most welcome. It's been a joy to be with you. And please keep me in your prayers. I'll pray for all of you. And Let's pray for one another. God bless you all. I have really enjoyed my time with you tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Archbishop. So again, I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight. To restate, Leela will be sending an email to all of you with the video link to tonight's presentation. So we encourage you to share this presentation uh, in your local church, if you like, uh, however you like, but please feel free to share it widely. Also in that email will be an invitation for you to join the Just Faith Network. Almost every week, we send some kind of resource to all members of the network at no charge. So please take advantage of this free offering. And finally, I'd like to invite you to next month's Acting for Justice event on Thursday, August 18th, as staff members from the Catholic Social Justice Lobby Network will address the topic of voting for the common good with an emphasis on how each one of us can put our faith into action in anticipation of the midterm elections in November. I hope you'll join us. I'll close to our time tonight with a short prayer. So until next month, we at Just Faith Ministries wish you well. Thank you for joining us. Let us pray. God of life, God that gives life, we pray to be a people who in our walk in our work and in our words, bring life to all. Give us the determination to resist the forces of death, the machinery of death, the economy of death. We ask your Holy Spirit to make us a holy people, a different people, a peaceful people, whose message of peace and justice, peace with justice, peace for justice, brings hope and possibility to this gift of creation you have given. We give thanks. We offer our lives 
we pray for peace. Amen. And good night, everybody, and thank you for joining us.